This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone had a nice weekend. Uh, I'm so delighted to introduce a very special speaker who is with us this morning, Dr. Harmony Runnels, who is an associate professor at New York University School of Medicine. She's a director of Sarah Ross Sauter Center for Women's Cardiovascular Health and associate director of Cardiovascular Clinical Research Center there. Uh, Dr. Reynolds went to NYU for medical school and stayed on for internal medicine and cardiology training at NYU slash uh, Bellevue Hospital. Uh, she really does it all and is very inspiring. She's an active clinician uh, focusing on ischemic uh, heart disease syndromes, particularly non-obstructive coronary artery disease. Uh, she has um, research funding from AHA and NIH. Um, she's had received many awards over the years, including um, AHA Luminary Award for Women Go Red campaign, AHA Rockstar of Science Award, Wenger Award for Mentoring, NYU Postdoc Mentoring Award. Um, the list goes on. Um, she is she was also on the um, executive steering committee for the ischemia trial, and that's how I first got to know her, uh, and also because of our many conversations related to the complex syndromes of uh, patients who present with uh, myocardial infarction but non-obstructive coronary artery disease. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Reynolds, who is going to give us her insights into this complex problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Mehta, for inviting me and for that kind introduction. I'm going to talk to you all today about an update on myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries, or MINOCA. First, let's make sure we're all talking about the same thing. There's a standardized AHA definition of MINOCA, and it's really centered on the universal definition of MI. So we need our patients to have a rise and fall of troponin, at least one value above the upper reference limit, the 99th percentile, and that's the sex-specific one and something that shows this is coming from the heart, symptoms, EKG changes, new wall motion, abnormality, or perfusion defect. And when we think about non-obstructive coronary arteries, that can range from completely normal coronary arteries all the way through 49% stenosis. And that threshold is a little bit arbitrary, but you gotta set a threshold somewhere. There has to also be no specific alternate cause for the clinical presentation. The idea being that if you know this patient really has sepsis and has an elevated troponin, then you're not gonna call it MI and you're not gonna call it MINOCA. If you see that there's pulmonary embolism, that's the diagnosis, not MINOCA, just because the arteries are open. And if it's a case of myocarditis, like an 18 year old with influenza who's got chest pain and EKG changes, you know that that's influenza myocarditis. So if the arteries are open, if you're checking a cath, you're really sort of just doing it to make sure. If the arteries are open, you think that's myocarditis, so we wouldn't call it MINOCA. MINOCA is six to 15% of MI, and that 15% is women with non-STEMI. That's a very robust estimate from a large uh, study led by Nat Smilowitz, who works with me. And it's more common among women, among younger patients and among people of color. So at places like Emory and at places like NYU, we're gonna see a lot of this. The patients who have Minoka have fewer risk factors than those with MI and obstructive coronary disease, but about 75% will have at least one coronary disease risk factor. And as we think about screening for the study that we're doing here and at NYU, uh, that becomes important. When encountering this syndrome, clinicians and patients will generally ask, was this really a heart attack? What's the treatment? What's the prognosis? Well, it presents just like MI with coronary disease. And without going through all the different bar graphs here, you can see with MICAD on the left and MINOCA on the right, that the symptom presentation is pretty much identical. And we expect that because it's a heart attack. What about the prognosis? Well, there are many studies that show this, but the prognosis of MINOCA is intermediate between those with MI and coronary disease and people who were not having a heart attack. And in this example, we're seeing two-year all-cause death or non-fatal MI, and we see Minoka right in the middle here. Another thing that we see commonly across studies is that those patients presenting with entirely normal coronaries and those presenting with some athero on the angiogram have a similar prognosis. But major adverse cardiovascular events definitely accrue after Minoka. We see three large studies here. This was the first large study to document the adverse prognosis of this problem from the Sweetheart Registry. We see there's a four-year death rate after Minoka of 13.4%, recurrent MI of 7%, heart failure hospitalization 6%, and with 4% stroke, that's a 24% four-year rate of major adverse cardiovascular events. In patients with Minoka who are over 65, and this is from CAF-PCI, there's a one-year MACE rate of 18%. 
And in the largest of these analyses, a meta-analysis of 30,000 patients, the one-year MACE rate after Minoka is 10%. This is not a good thing to have. Predictors of adverse outcomes across studies are ST elevation, lower EF, and older age. Reinfarction after Minoka is interesting. And this is from Sweetheart, again, that 9,000 patient uh, Minoka registry. And first thing we can see is there are 570 patients who had a recurrent MI during their follow-up, and only about half of them went back to the cath lab. And I assume this is because the doctors thought they knew what they were dealing with and assumed it was another Minoka. But interestingly, it often wasn't. For the patients who did go to the cath lab, about half had progressed to obstructive coronary disease on their second cath. And on the right, what we're seeing is that no matter what the interval was between those two events, it was about half the likelihood that the patients would have progressed with that second MI to obstructive coronary disease. And I think this tells us something about the initial event, that it was likely also atherosclerosis related. The best treatment of this problem is unknown. I hope I have convinced you that it is an important problem, but no treatment trials have been performed because even though the event rates are concerning, they are lower than in traditional MI and we'd have to power something very large. So for now we use mechanistic and observational data to guide management. I'd like to take you through some of those. This is the differential diagnosis. This is everything that causes Minoka. It can be from plaque rupture, plaque erosion, from coronary spasm, rarely it's from dissection, some patients have isolated thrombus. Some patients have Takasubo syndrome as an alternate cause. And some patients turn out to have myocarditis when we do additional testing. They weren't initially suspected to have myocarditis, but we get a surprise. We know that the angiogram, while one of the most important tests that we can do in somebody with a heart attack, is limited because it shows us the lumen and it does not show us the wall. And here is a classic example. So here's an LED coronary angiogram. It looks pretty good. These two spots look quite similar, but on intravascular ultrasound, they're different. So for those of you who don't look at IVUS all the time, here is an uh, intravascular ultrasound catheter. Then we've got just this is the wall of the vessel and it looks thin and normal at this spot. But at this spot, which is also normal on the angiogram, we see that the lumen is the same size and we knew that, but there's this big area of crescentic plaque. So just an illustration that there's more to the angiogram than we might see. Similarly, not all plaque rupture is going to be angiographically evident. So this is a schematic of a cross-section of a plaque with a necrotic core, smooth muscle cells, inflammatory cells. And if this plaque should rupture and we get a thrombus that looks like this, well, we're going to see that on an angiogram. But if instead the thrombus is smaller, we might not see it at all, or we might just see a non-obstructive appearance. And yet this thrombus can embolize and cause infarction. Similarly with plaque erosion, different underlying plaque morphology with more smooth muscle and proteoglycans, but the same idea holds. How common is this? Single center studies have demonstrated plaque rupture, erosion, or thrombus in somewhere between 29 and 50% of patients with Minoka. And we did a multi-center study in women called HARP that showed a rate of 43%. This rate is lower than in ST elevation MI, and it's higher than in asymptomatic patients with coronary disease. And you just don't see any plaque rupture in stable INOCA in those microvascular disease patients or spasm patients. If you rule out myocarditis or spasm first, we'd get a higher hit rate. But interestingly, the angiogram may not be that helpful in picking out who's going to have a rupture. 30% of patients with Minoka who were rated in HARP as having a normal angiogram by the site had an OCT culprit lesion when reviewed at the core lab. And culprit lesions were only located in the worst plaque on angiogram half the time when present. So I would like to be able to say that we can target imaging to those plaques and it doesn't seem that we can. Let's turn to coronary artery spasm. This is a common cause of Minoka. If we see it spontaneously at cath, that may be helpful, although we recognize that catheters can induce spasm too. Provocative testing isn't usually done during an acute angiogram unless let's say it was a recurrent case and a low risk one. But studies using provocative testing have shown that somewhere between a quarter and two thirds of Minoka patients will have inducible spasm. And when spasm is induced, about half of it is epicardial, you'll see a transient 90% stenosis, and the other half is microvascular, where there may be EKG changes, recapitulation of symptoms, but you don't see a 90% stenosis. Studies that do spasm testing show that prior chest pain before the MI or recurrent chest pain afterward may be a clue that spasm is present. Most with spasm are going to have some plaque, and that's sort of a fundamental observation that we know about spasm for years. Another clue to spasm may be myocardial bridging. In one study, acetylcholine testing was abnormal in most patients who had a myocardial bridge, and that was the site. 
And interestingly, exposure to air pollution is independently associated with positive testing for spasm in Minoka and Inoka patients. And that's something that I think deserves further investigation. Let's think about thrombosis, thromboembolism, and thrombophilia. We have definitely seen a couple of cases in association with exogenous hormone use, whether to stop menstrual bleeding or for IVF cycling. Um, but there is a little bit of an excess of those things that we think of as thrombophilia in Minoka patients. Factor V Leiden or activated protein C resistance in 9 to 15% of younger Minoka patients as compared to 3 to 5% of age and sex match patients with MINCAD. And in another study, about a quarter of Minoka patients had an inherited thrombophilia that was similar to cryptogenic stroke. If antiphospholipid antibodies are present in an MI patient, the hit rate on Minoka is 20%, not the 6% that we see overall. So these are certainly related in some way. Coronary dissection is a cause of Minoka, but most dissection is not Minoka. And I think these two syndromes get conflated because they both disproportionately affect younger women, but it's important to keep them separate in our minds. Dissection is an angiographic diagnosis the overwhelming majority of the time. We see an example here of an artery that has an abrupt change in caliber, and then it is small for the rest of that vessel. That pathogenesis is from intramural hematoma, and it has just dissected down the whole vessel. But we can see that on the angiogram. You're not going to do intracoronary imaging in this case. You know what that is. It would be Minoka also if we need to make the diagnosis using intracoronary imaging because we can't tell on the angiogram what it is. An example here is this tubular stenosis that is isolated. On intracoronary imaging, we have an intramural hematoma here. That's about one to 5% of Minoka and among SCAD patients, it's also probably single digit percentages that they present non-obstructive. Now we get into the alternate diagnoses. When we do additional testing, we may see it's not a heart attack at all, it's really something else. Let's talk about myocarditis. The clinical presentation mimicking MI is quite common and the cardiac MRI is diagnostic as in this example where we see Lake Adelinium enhancement in the epicardial region here, outside a coronary territory, we see it in spot here and there. Uh, this CMR pattern is present in 15 to 33% of cases that are clinically diagnosed as Minoka. This is Anais Hausfader, who used to be my fellow and is now on faculty. And she did a meta-analysis showing that you're more likely to find myocarditis on an MRI if there are angiographically normal coronaries among men and in younger patients. Many studies show the sooner you scan, the more likely you are to find myocarditis, which is really a reason to do MRI as soon as possible, ideally inpatient, because if you find a diagnosis of myocarditis, the treatment completely changes from our usual complement of secondary prevention medications to just supportive care, and after they recover, maybe nothing. Other alternate diagnoses are Takasubo syndrome and other cardiomyopathies. Takasubo, of course, is the reversible left ventricular dysfunction syndrome with elevated troponin that presents like an MI. The diagnosis may be suspected based on wall motion pattern and triggering by stress, but as we were talking about last night at dinner, a cath is still needed because an MI can cause a similar wall motion pattern, and you don't want to miss that. In some cases, you may not be sure if there's infarct or not, and cardiac MRI may be useful to be sure, because there is a differential diagnosis to a Takasubo wall motion pattern. It can be coronary spasm. It can be left main or LAD SCAD. It could be left main or LAD plaque rupture, either with obstructive appearance or not. And hypertrophic cardiomyopathy we're showing is a cause of a Takasubo appearance. Also, we've seen some cases show up as Minoka. And once we get an MRI, we see it's really HCM. It's really a regular cardiomyopathy or it might be cardiac amyloidosis. We have this whole differential diagnosis. And what's the point of pinning down exactly which problem we have? The point is that the treatment logically would be different. We don't have clinical trials to show this, but if we're trying to treat according to the underlying cause and guidelines suggest we should do this, we would be giving antiplatelet therapy and statin to those who have an active plaque, calcium blockers and nitrates to spasm patients. I'm not sure what we should be giving to dissection patients, but probably not antiplatelet and certainly no statin, maybe beta blockade. If we see a thromboembolism, well, we're going to look for the source and give antiplatelet or anticoagulant therapy. If it's Takasubo syndrome, we're not sure how to treat that, but observational studies would suggest ACE inhibitor. And then if it's myocarditis, we just need supportive care. So it does have the potential to impact the way that we're treating the patient if we find the underlying cause. How can we do this? Um, this really becomes a stepwise approach, and there are multiple society statements that are now recommending taking a, a logical stepwise diagnostic approach to sorting this out. 
basically you start with somebody who meets the universal definition and does not have obstructive coronary disease. And then we have to think, is there an alternate cause of this presentation rather than MI? Is it really PE? There was a study of 100 patients, consecutive Minoka patients who got CT to rule out pulmonary embolism. None of them had pulmonary embolism, but I still advocate getting a D-dimer and thinking about it because occasionally we have been surprised. Is there a cardiac contusion? Is it a non-ischemic injury? Could it be sepsis? And then once we've ruled those things out, we say, well, let's go back to the angiogram because as much as it was evaluated during the case, sometimes if we look back, we see a branch vessel cut off or we see a dissection in a branch that we might have noticed before. And then we say, well, is it really MI at all? Is this really Minoka? Cardiac MRI is critically important to rule out myocarditis and look for other cardiomyopathies in Takasubo. And then we're left with somebody that we really believe has Minoka and we might want to figure out why this Minoka happened. We can look at the patterns of late gadolinium enhancement and regional edema on that MRI. We can use coronary intravascular imaging to search for a culprit lesion, and we can do coronary functional assessment to test for spasm. We followed this type of diagnostic algorithm in a multicenter study called the Women's Heart Attack Research Program, and Emory and Dr. Mehta uh, were very kind to participate. We were looking to find the frequency of each of the vascular causes on intracoronary optical coherence tomography, or OCT, we wanted to see what the myocardial abnormalities were on cardiac MRI, whether ischemic or non-ischemic, and try and put this together to find out underlying causes. We enrolled women with MI who were referred for cath with the intent to perform PCI. And I say it this way to point out that these are patients that the clinical team believed were MI. So when you see that we have a relatively low myocarditis rate, you can see that the clinical diagnosis here was MI. We were careful about that. If patients had an alternate explanation for troponin elevation, they were not enrolled. They had their study consent and got their clinical cath. If they had obstructive coronary disease or angiographic dissection, they had no research imaging. But if they had Minoka, they were to get three vessel OCT and cardiac MRI with a comprehensive protocol. The images were read at core laboratories and each core lab was blinded to the results at the other laboratories. We had 301 women and 145 of them had interpretable OCT. 46% had a culprit lesion. These were mostly either plaque rupture or the early sequela of plaque rupture, which I will show you. A few had thrombus without plaque rupture, plaque erosion. A couple had a signature of spasm with some intimal bumping and one had dissection. We had three vessel OCT in 60%. There were no major complications, but there was a lot of transient spasm and it was something that was noted by the core lab. I'm gonna take you through a few OCT findings and I think it's helpful to see a normal. This is the OCT catheter. It goes with a guide wire and OCT does radial imaging. So there are gonna be outward shadows from the guide wire or from anything we encounter in the uh, intimal interface. The lumen is cleared by contrast because OCT uses light to make images so you don't see through blood. And this is the intima, dark band is the media. And then we have the adventitia and perivascular tissue. Here is an example of a plaque rupture. And these will also show three frames from distal to proximal, just to give you a sense of moving through the lesion. Here distally, we see these arrows point to little lakes of dark contrast inside the wall. And we see as we pull back a little bit that there is this very smudgy section and that's plaque. You see the irregular border here. We don't see the media. And in between the border and the media is plaque that just doesn't transmit light very well. So there's a lot of attenuation. This thing marked by the double arrowheads is a thrombus. And as the interventionalist pulled back further, we see that this meets criteria for a thin cap fibroatheroma, and there is a defect here. The arrowhead should be rotated a little bit. This is a plaque rupture. When you think about Minoka plaque ruptures compared to MICAD plaque ruptures, we're gonna see smaller arc of plaque, not so big of a cavity, but otherwise the morphology is similar. The first step in healing is to show the appearance of an intraplaque cavity, and that one is shown here. This has this crescentic area of low attenuation, but it's not as attenuated as the lipidic plaque. We can see there is blood in the wall here. It's also called intraplaque hemorrhage, but there's still a very thin cap as you can see there. And you get the sense that this may just have sealed. So this is early after plaque rupture. With further healing, you'll see the appearance of layered plaque. The asterisk marks an area of lipid rich plaque. It's very smudgy, you don't see through it, right? You expect to see the media like you do here, but that's obliterated or we don't see it uh, because of the plaque. But you can see that there's this bright yellow internal layer as the plaque is beginning to heal, a multiple layered plaque. And this is something that is seen in acute MI on pathology and on OCT.
If we look across studies of Minoka, as I mentioned to you before, intracoronary imaging will find an OCT culprit lesion in about 50% of patients. And that is pretty consistent across a number of studies. This study that showed a rate of 80%, they ruled out myocarditis first. So you can get a very high likelihood of seeing a culprit lesion. And then there is some earlier studies using different technology. The big lessons from the intracoronary imaging studies are that there is an OCT culprit lesion in about half of Minoka patients, which was not initially expected, that you can see an OCT culprit lesion even when the angiogram looks normal. The more vessels that were imaged, the more culprit lesions that were found. So these are mostly non-STEMI cases, and it's hard to find a culprit in a non-STEMI case. Even when there's obstructive coronary disease, it may be uncertain. And that's true in Minoka as well. Putting this together with a Japanese comparator cohort of MICAD patients, we see that there really is a spectrum across the level of angiographic stenosis of what type of culprit lesion you're going to see on OCT. If there is very little stenosis, then it's mostly going to be layered plaque or intraplaque hemorrhage with less erosion and rupture. As we move towards the most stenosis, we see the most plaque rupture with a little bit of erosion and less in the way of layered plaque. And again, comparing the, I showed you last time the comparison of the actual um, images between these types of culprit lesions. They look really similar from Minoka to MICAD, but the lumen's always bigger in Minoka, obviously, and the plaques are smaller. Intraplaque hemorrhage is not something that I think we usually talk about as cardiologists, but it's something that we should be talking about. This is something recognized at autopsy in sudden death cases. And this is a, a pathologic example. You can see at this magnification that there's hemorrhage into a plaque, and this is a lipidic plaque. We're all accustomed to seeing images like this and thinking of them as active plaques. But what we would have expected to see maybe is a thrombus. And the arrow is magnified here. You can see that this looks like the rupture has just sealed and there isn't a luminal thrombus. In this autopsy study, among 49 patients with fatal ischemic heart disease, three quarters of whom were men, 63 of 103 ruptured plaques had this intraplaque hemorrhage and did not have luminal thrombus. So we know this is something that causes MI and sudden cardiac death. When we see it in Minoka, we're gonna think of it similarly. Here is an OCT-based example, and you can see that it looks very similar to the pathology example. Our OCT core lab director is keen on doing OCT pathologic correlation and seeing that there's a lot of similarity. In HARP, 89% of cases of intraplaque hemorrhage were associated with cardiac MRI findings of ischemic injury, again, cementing the idea that this is pathologic in this patient. Let's turn to our MRI findings. 116 of our women came back for MRI, and one-third had CMR evidence of infarction. Like this example, the here is lake adelinum enhanced imaging on the left and T2 weighted imaging on the right in both white is abnormal. And we see transmural lake adelinum enhancement going from base to apex in this case with associated edema showing this is an acute infarction. And in fact, the edema goes beyond the area of infarct, which is pretty typical. Our median time from MI to cardiac MRI was six days. We also saw a regional injury pattern. This is an area of edema, one of the earliest consequences of ischemia, including in experimental models. And it's within a coronary territory, might be associated with a wall motion abnormality, but there is not lake adelinum enhancement. We saw that in 21% of the patients. An additional 21% of patients had a non-ischemic finding. Here is a case of myocarditis. You can see lake adelinum enhancement that's pretty diffuse. It skips, it's mid-myocardial here, clearly not ischemic and it has T2 signal hyperintensity, and 26% of them were normal. When we put these together in the patients who had both OCT and cardiac MRI, we can make a number of observations. So one is that if there was an OCT culprit lesion, there were ischemic findings, either MI or regional edema, in 69% of those cases, showing us that these culprit lesions are in fact causing MI because people wondered if they might be bystanders. Looking across at those patients who had MI or regional injury, about half had an OCT culprit and about half did not have an OCT culprit. And we think those without had spasm or embolism or both. Looking across studies now at the likelihood of finding an MI in a Minoka patient on MRI, it's about half if you use the regional edema as an indicator, which people are increasingly doing. And I'll show you um, prognosis that's related to that in a few slides. If we only use infarct, then we're going to see an infarct in about a quarter of patients. 
If we try and cone down on those patients who had MI or regional edema, it would be interesting to know how those findings are related to an OCT culprit lesion. And we saw that if there was a culprit, it was pretty likely to have regional injury, this regional edema pattern, um, but with about half and half. Without an OCT culprit, most of the time we're seeing late gadolinium enhancement. So that may tell us something about how long the artery has been critically narrowed and what we're seeing in terms of long range damage. We wondered if having an OCT culprit lesion would be associated with a larger or smaller uh, infarct size when an infarct was present. Turns out no difference. So again, I think it's less about the mechanism of infarction and more about the duration of the compromised flow. Key findings from women's HARP, multimodality imaging in women with Minoka, were that 64% of Minoka patients had imaging evidence of myocardial infarction, whether on OCT, MRI, or both. 21% had a non-ischemic alternate cause. OCT and MRI provided useful diagnostic information independently and in combination, 85% overall. And they correlated, showing us that non-obstructive culprit lesions do frequently cause Minoka. We think spasm or thromboembolism likely caused MI or regional injury in cases without a culprit. So ultimately, the mechanisms of Minoka are similar to the mechanisms of our typical MI patients, atherothrombosis with a possible contribution of spasm, and some patients don't have MI, which serial MRI studies show even if you see coronary disease, some of those patients don't have MI either. We're trying to use these findings to change the thinking about what Minoka is. And I think this concept map is helpful. This was created, this beautiful artistry is from Julia Wong, who's a visiting medical student from Georgetown. So we saw two major, major patterns of MRI abnormalities in women with Minoka. One was this large region of injury or large MI. And we're seeing a vessel that either looks entirely normal or has some minor narrowing at an angiogram. But how about if we walk that back? What do we think the status of that vessel was at the time the infarct happened? Well, we could start with an inciting event where we had a plaque rupture. If we get critical narrowing by some combination of plaque rupture or erosion, thrombus, and spasm, we can get there either because spasm happened first near an existing plaque and it caused that plaque to become unstable and create a thrombus, or maybe there was a plaque that became unstable, had a little thrombus, and that incited spasm. Either way, we're going to wind up with something that looks like this. Maybe that plaque ruptured and there was a small thrombus that became a larger thrombus. And then we had spontaneous thrombolysis. And that's why we see a non-obstructive appearance at an angiogram. So that is one possible pathway. I am not sure this is really a likely path, though, because we don't see a lot of thrombus when we do Minoka OCTs. But, you know, maybe these are presenting as MICAD cases. And maybe there's more of a spectrum of abnormality. If we have somebody that just has no plaque, well, clearly they would have had severe vasospasm and that would be their mechanism, or they might've had a thromboembolism. And then if we think about how dissection would occur, give us an infarct and then show a non-obstructive appearance, then we'd think there's a small intramural hematoma, it becomes something that's flow limiting, and then it ruptures into the lumen, allowing that hematoma to uh, move backward and we see a non-obstructive appearance. So trying to think through stepwise what we're seeing. The other pattern we saw were small MIs, like this sort of embolic thing. You see that white subendocardial splotch there. Really looks like a small branch vessel has been knocked out. Well, how would that happen? We could have a plaque rupture or erosion in a proximal vessel, like that schematic that I showed you, and it may embolize distally. We definitely observe this frequently in Minoka patients. But sometimes we don't see an OCT culprit lesion, and it's conceivable that a plaque rupture is occurring within that branch. So that's another possible mechanism. And then you can just have thromboembolism or in situ coronary thrombosis that might lead to something like this. But there are so many more questions to answer. Why do female MI patients have Minoka more often than males? Well, we're doing a multimodality imaging study now in men and women, and Emory and St. Joe's are participating. We'd really like you to refer your patients. Are the mechanisms different between women and men? Not only are we doing imaging in this study, but we're getting a blood biorepository to try and get at mechanisms, including genetics. Can we target imaging to specific patients? A larger sample size will strengthen analyses on this, because I've told you that the OCT doesn't allow us to target, and I'll show you that the MRI of the troponin clinical characteristics are not going to allow us to target uh, MRI to certain patients either. So we're doing HARP 2.0, enrolling 200 additional men and women with Minoka. The Emory Health Enrolling Center PI is Dr. Pooja Mehta, and the St. Joseph's PI is Dr. Olga Tolova, and Brian and Patik are helping out too. Thank you very much for spending time with us talking last night.
Here are the current HARP study sites, and they're really across US and Canada. The imaging study design is very similar to what we did before. Patients with MI that you believe have MI and are sending to CAF because you expect them to get PCI. They're gonna get consent before the CAF. We asked them some questions about stress. I'll show you results on that in a few. And then they have their clinical CAF and get a biorepository sample. If they have obstructive coronary disease, no research imaging. But if they have Minoka, three vessel OCT, cardiac MRI within a week, and follow up every six months. The inclusion criteria are just clinical diagnosis of MI. The exclusion criteria are prior stent or a prior bypass, an alternate explanation for the troponin elevation, which I'll talk about again. And if they just had something that was vasospastic, if they just used cocaine, if they've just been given a chemotherapeutic agent that you know induced spasm, because if you know the diagnosis, we don't need additional testing to sort that out. We exclude patients if the GFR is too low for contrast, and if they got lytic, because we don't know what the status of the vessel was before lytic. When we think about alternate explanation, as you guys are seeing patients and thinking about referring them for the study, I would just ask you to keep in mind that there are some clinical scenarios that cause troponin elevation and may cause chest discomfort, and we know they're not MI, like I was talking about before. If somebody has new onset heart failure, you know, they have an EF of 20, they have a mildly elevated troponin, you think you know what that is. That's not for our study. If they have critical AS, they run for a bus, they pass out, they develop a troponin elevation, you know what that's from. But some cases need more clinical judgment. So there, and it's not always so clear what is a type two supply demand mismatch type of MI and what is a true Minoka event that might've been a vascular problem. So I'll give you an example. Um, we had a young woman who had heavy menstrual bleeding and had a hemoglobin that was seven, eight. And she had, she was a little tachycardic. She had some chest pain, she has a minor troponin elevation. And people said, this is probably supply demand mismatch. But you know, she's 44, she had no coronary risk factors and her troponin kept going up even after she got transfused. And you know, her hemoglobin wasn't five. That wasn't really enough reason to have an elevated troponin. And when she went into the study, she had a plaque rupture and an infarct, which nobody was expecting. And it completely changed her management because there's no way anybody's giving her antiplatelet therapy, she was bleeding and nobody would bother with a statin. She didn't have risk factors. So the testing really has the potential to shift the care. But the key thing here is when you're thinking about referring a patient, you'd say, if this patient has completely normal arteries, as I look at the specifics of this clinical case, am I sure I know why that troponin elevation happened? And if not, then we leave the idea open that it could have been vascular and we enroll in the study. So please refer your patients. Um, let's talk about prognosis. We're getting emerging data that the imaging findings on these tests can tell us something about the future risk of the patient. Is that the first one? Yeah. Atherosclerotic culprit lesions may be associated with worse prognosis than no culprit on OCT. And honestly, this makes a lot of sense, but it's only recently been shown. So these patients are the ones with an atherosclerotic finding, and these are the patients without. And we can see that athero does worse but we also know we can't see that on the angiogram. Um, here's a meta-analysis of cardiac MRI findings in Minoka. And this one shows that finding a true myocardial infarction is associated with worse prognosis. Here is another one now looking at that regional injury pattern because that was a missing link in the chain. Is regional edema truly associated with poorer prognosis? And it is. That's this middle blue line. And over the long term, those regional edema patients do worse than patients who have normal MRI, and those with infarct will do worse still. And in multivariable analysis, the number of segments affected by edema or by infarct was associated with worse prognosis. And that again, makes sense, but it's nice to see it in print. Um, multiple studies have looked at the outcomes after MRI, and unlike the first one I showed you, most will say that if you have a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, including Takasubo, those patients will do the worst. And then the MI patients, then myocarditis. This study shows us that after a pretty long follow-up, normal cardiac MRI patients have an excellent long-term prognosis. But I will keep in mind for you that normal cardiac MRI can occur with plaque rupture, so it doesn't mean that nothing happened to those patients. If you get away with a normal CMR, you're still considered to have Minoka. And the timing of that MRI matters because it's much more likely to be normal when it's done later. That may be just because you missed it. How else does getting a diagnosis matter? Well, the patients feel better about having a diagnosis. This is very similar to our stable INOCA patients who are getting tested. They come out with a diagnosis. They know what's wrong. So the 
NACE rate was similar in patients in this study who did or did not get a diagnosis, but people who did not get a diagnosis are more likely to come back to the ER because they don't understand their problem. How should we manage this problem? There are ESC guidelines on acute coronary syndrome that include an entire section dedicated to Minoka, and there are three main recommendations. Cardiac MRI for everybody, unless you already know what it is, by which I mean cocaine chest pain with ST elevation. Um, management of Minoka according to the final diagnosis, according to whatever that diagnosis is. So if it looks like a type one MI with plaque rupture after you've done OCT, you would treat it like a typical MI. If you see that instead it's most likely to be spasm, arteries are completely clean and you saw spasm during the case, that's calcium blockers and nitrates. So different pathway. And then in all patients with an initial working diagnosis of Minoka, it's recommended to follow a diagnostic algorithm to determine the final diagnosis. That algorithm looks a lot like what we're doing in heart. CMR is also a class 2A recommendation in the 2021 chest pain guidelines in cases of Minoka in case the European guidelines are not good enough for you. And the statement here is that secondary prevention therapies should be considered for those with evidence of coronary disease and to control risk factors. Should every patient have cardiac MRI? Well, the ESC guideline says so, but why is that? What about if we don't get it right away? This study is very helpful in that regard. They looked at patients with Minoka and separated them based on more elevated troponin or less elevated troponin, and the scan interval within two weeks or later than two weeks. Now, of course, the yield is going to be highest if you have somebody with a higher troponin and they're scanned within two weeks. But look at this. Even patients with a very minimal troponin elevation scanned at more than two weeks, half of them had something diagnostic on cardiac MRI. So we want to get it sooner. The yield will be better, but it's still worthwhile even if you can't get it acutely. That highest yield subset of the 94% was only about a quarter of this cohort. So we're not going to get the MRI soon and with a high troponin in everyone. Older age and male sex were independently associated with a diagnosis. But interestingly, the lowest peak troponin with a diagnostic cardiac MRI was 15 on a high sensitivity assay. We saw something very similar in HARP. There was no lower bound of troponin beyond which it wasn't worth getting your MRI. MRI was always potentially useful. Let's think about these ST elevation patients. All of these studies I've shown you tend to be focused on non-ST, especially with the intracoronary imaging because we're getting pre-cath consent. But from the Midwest STEMI consortium, we have some data on ST elevation Minoka. They used a 60% threshold and they see that 5% of STEMI had suspected Minoka. But it's very important to get cardiac MRI in these patients also because they found that three quarters of them had an alternate diagnosis on the cardiac MR, Takasubo syndrome, myocarditis, or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and about a quarter had evidence of myocardial infarction. And we need more data in STEMI. Let's talk about secondary prevention. We had this observational study of secondary prevention after Minoka from Sweetheart, over 9,000 patients, and they constructed propensity score matched cohorts by medical treatment with a mean follow up of four years. In all of these plots, red are patients that are treated, selected for treatment by their doctor with these classes of medicines, and blue were not treated. And even with propensity matching, you can see that patients who are given statins tended to do better, patients given ACE or ARB tended to do better. With beta blockade, there was a trend toward better outcome. And here for the combined MACE endpoint, we see no effect of DAPT, although dual antiplatelet therapy did trend towards lower all-cause mortality, and that was also true in a meta-analysis. So we may want to give a lot of our secondary prevention medicines to these patients based on observational data. But we need randomized trials, and there are two I know of going on. One is in Scotland, uh, and that one is called StratMed Minoka. Colin Berry is running that. And he has patients who get an IMR after their Minoka during their diagnostic angiogram. And if it's elevated, they're being randomized to spironolactone or control. If it's low, they go into a registry. There is another one led by Filippo Crea in Italy, which is precision medicine versus standard of care with the primary outcome of the Seattle Angina questionnaire. And this is basically doing a full diagnostic evaluation versus just usual care. So we'll see the results of that soon. What about platelets? I've told you that I think thrombus is part of the pathogenesis, maybe regardless of the inciting event. What do we know about platelets in Minoka? Well, many people obviously have non-obstructive plaque, and we know that atherosclerosis progresses over time through repeated cycles of rupture and healing. But most of these events are mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic. So why is it that we have Minoka then? 
many of these events are gonna be asymptomatic. Some people with small plaque ruptures will rise to clinical attention with MI. Some will make large thrombi and show up as MI with coronary disease and others are clinically silent. And we think that looking at platelets may be helpful in sorting this out. Jeffrey Berger, my colleague at NYU is therefore doing this study where he gets platelet RNA and whole blood RNA and platelet activity from Minoka patients, matched patients with MI and coronary disease enrolled in HARP, and controls with no obstructive coronary disease. And the nice thing about looking at platelet RNA is that platelets don't have nuclei. So the RNA in that platelet that you're getting in the acute MI setting is RNA that was made before the MI even happened and is more reflective of the pre-MI state. And it's rare to get that window. We're seeing that in platelet RNA sequencing, you can see that this heat map this is undifferentiated and it, it segregates control in MI pretty well, actually. And if we look at a volcano plot, we see that there are definitely candidates that are different between controls and MIs. And this is Tessa Barrett, the PhD who does this work. If we look at the pathways that are most differentially regulated between MI patients and controls in this study, they are things related to platelet activity, as you would expect, actin, integrins, so this makes sense. MI patients have more activated looking platelet RNA than control patients. But what about MICAD versus Minoka? Again, we get good segregation of our Minoka patients from MICAD based solely on platelet RNA. And we see that there are some outliers here that may help us understand pathogenesis. But the pathways now are not related to platelet activation. And that probably tells us that thrombosis is important in both syndromes. It is not, as I had hypothesized, that platelets are overactive in Minoka patients. They make big thrombi, then we lyse them. Um, it is probably that they are just, these are different plaques that are rising to clinical attention differently. Because the main pathways that are different between Minoka and MICAD in platelet RNA sequencing are mostly related to inflammation. So maybe this is an inflammatory problem. We're also looking at whole blood RNA sequencing and Tessa has shown in a smaller subset to begin with that the top pathway that is differentially regulated between Minoka and MI with coronary disease and between Minoka and controls is related to estrogen receptor signaling. And that is super interesting because of course we know that Minoka is more common among female MI patients and also that estrogen may be related to coronary spasm. So more work to come on that front. We're also doing unsupervised analysis of whole blood RNA sequencing to try and figure out which key pathways are implicated in Minoka with our bioinformatics team. What about stress? This is an area that Emory is very interested in mental stress as it relates to ischemia. And we've wondered if Minoka might be caused by higher stress and to put a very simple phrasing on it, you know, if this is not caused by obstructive coronary disease, then maybe it's stress. And certainly our clinicians, our women have been told multiple times that maybe they're just stressed out because after all, they don't have that much plaque. Interestingly, stress is not the problem. Um, we see this is done work done by Anais Hausfader, who I mentioned before, and Tanya Sproul, a behavioral psychologist that I work with at NYU. And this is 172 Minoka patients, 314 patients with MI and CAD, and these are all women. We see that stress is higher in the MI-CAD patients. So the Minoka women are not just stressed out. They really have some atherothrombotic underlying pathogenesis. Depressive symptoms also were not different. We're trying to use the data to get a far reaching understanding of MI in women. And we see that resilience is related to stress and depression. And people who already have um, low resilience or more prone to be under high stress at the time of their MI and in recovery and to have more depressive symptoms. All right, take home points. If you came in late on the Zoom, then you only need these five slides. Um, invasive testing is important in Minoka. And if we think about the resolution of CT versus OCT versus intracoronary imaging, these pictures of the Mona Lisa will give us a sense, right? That CT has great resolution, but it's not as good as intracoronary imaging. CT will detect plaque, but not plaque rupture or erosion or thrombus. And a CMR defined infarct can be from spasm or it could be from active plaque. Identification of the underlying diagnosis is going to help us tailor therapy, so it's important. Intracoronary imaging is usually performed at the diagnostic angiogram, but it can be done afterwards, especially if you see an infarct on cardiac MR. Spasm testing is usually reserved for patients with persistent chest pain, but you could consider it acutely if the suspicion is high, as in there is a recurrent Minoka event, let's say, and there's non-obstructive disease again, and the patient is stable. Cardiac MRI for everyone. The key role is to rule out myocarditis and another non-ischemic cause of the Minoka presentation. So it's important to tell the patient from the outset that they need that MRI and it's going to impact their therapy. 
The MRI is ideally performed in the first few days, but it still adds value more than two weeks later. If the MRI is normal, it would still be considered Minoka unless you found another cause, but normal cardiac MRI may be associated with better prognosis than abnormal. How do we use this to guide therapy, especially if we don't have intracoronary imaging, let's say? Well, look, is it abnormal? Do we have late gadolinium enhancement or edema? If no, it's normal. We don't know what the cause is. But if yes, is there an ischemic pattern with either late gadolinium enhancement or that's subendocardial or transmural or edema within a coronary territory? Well, if not, then it's not Minoka. It's myocarditis or a cardiomyopathy. But if we do have that, like this focal infarction here, or this area of regional edema with all that swelling of the myocardium, you see how thick it is there, then we have a vascular cause. But we may not know if it's plaque rupture or erosion or one of these early sequelae of plaque rupture, or is a coronary spasm, thrombosis, thromboembolism, or dissection. So we're going to have to treat for the most likely causes. Also, Minoka is likely multifactorial in many cases. As I walked you through that concept diagram, we're thinking that you need probably some contribution of active plaque spasm and thrombus. Some people have only two of these three. Some people really only have one thing, but there's probably more interplay than we realize. In a study that did OCT at spasm sites in patients who had MI or out of hospital arrest, there was plaque rupture or erosion quite frequently at spasm sites. It's probably multifactorial. How do we treat when the underlying diagnosis is uncertain today? Well, I would give antiplatelet therapy, statin unless there is absolutely no athero, calcium channel blockade in case there was spasm, I give ASAR based on sweetheart data that I showed you. And we give beta blockade. I give it if there's an infarct on MRI or low EF or if dissection was suspected. Thank you very much. And please, again, refer your patients for the HARP study. And um, I appreciate your attention and we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Uh, that was wonderful, as I expected. And um, we learned a lot about Minoka. Um, I've got a question here from... Um, Patrick Gleason, uh, why no uh, coronary CT angiogram? Could you elaborate a little bit on that? I know you mentioned it in your last slides, but why not CCTA? Because you can get a vessel specific sort of plaque specific analysis. I prefer to get intracoronary imaging if I can, Dr. Gleason, because I would like to know if there is something that looks like a rupture or erosion. That said, if I'm seeing a patient after their hospitalization, I don't usually send them back for intracoronary imaging. And then if I have a normal angiogram in that patient, I will get CT because the patients will ask, do I really need a statin? And you know, do I really need five drugs? And I like to be able to answer that question. So CT is really useful because if there is no plaque at all, Notwithstanding the potential pleiotrophic effects of statins, I don't give a statin if the arteries are totally normal. And that's the role of CT in my view. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, that, that was terrific. Uh, I'm reminded that uh, this weekend, a uh, funeral for Bill Roberts happened nearby here. Bill always thought that uh, thrombus was a uh, not always. I originally thought that thrombus was a post-mortem event, that thrombus didn't cause myocardial infarction. You remember that famous thing that Bill had to take back? But I, I, I'm, uh, I think there's some confusion from in myself between Minoka and Inoka. Uh, you haven't said anything about microcirculation. So when I saw the title of the talk, I'm thinking, okay, this is nothing wrong with the coronary arteries. This is something in the microcirculation. Um, and, and I was impressed by the uh, fact that ST elevation is not seen in Minoka very much. Um, do you think that's because it was there it, transiently and you miss it uh, or what? Thank you. A, a set of questions there that I'll, uh, be happy to answer and uh, hope to shed some light on. So first, Minoka versus Inoka. It turns out that if these non-obstructive ischemic heart disease patients, there's less overlap than I ever would have thought between those presenting with an acute MI and those who continue to have stable chest pain. And when I see post-MI chest pain continuing in these non-obstructive patients, it's almost always spasm. But the people who have chronic angina with no obstructive coronary disease, it's unusual for them to have MI. So it turns out they're fairly separate. And that's interesting to think about the pathogenesis. You mentioned that I didn't say much about microvascular coronary disease or really anything. 
I think it would be interesting to test for microvascular disease in Minoka patients. And we've tried to do that and others have tried, but the problem is if you have an infarct, you know, I've shown you these cases with big time myocardial edema, then that's compressing the microvasculature. So when we did stress cardiac MRI looking for microvascular disease, it was very commonly abnormal, but it was the same likelihood of being abnormal if they had myocarditis on that MRI or an infarct or nothing. So I think that it is, we can't get the window into the pre-MI state by testing for microvascular disease in the context of an acute MI. And so we cannot know if it might have been part of the pathogenesis to begin with. But as I think about microvascular coronary disease in patients with INOCA, they tend to have exertional angina, either with emotional stress or with exercise that is relieved by rest. So just like somebody with severe stable coronary disease, we think that something has to happen in order to elevate that to completely occlude the vessel and cause MI, like you talked about with Dr. Roberts at Thrombus, um, that there's some change in the status of that patient. And I think that if you have stable microvascular angina, it's still true. There must be some change. Maybe that was spasm because microvascular patients are prone to spasm, but it shouldn't be microvascular disease alone, unless it's some unique thing. Like, you know, they, they ran and they couldn't stop. They outstripped their capability. Like they shoveled snow with their severe coronary disease. So I don't really believe that microvascular disease on its own can cause MI. Um, and then you asked another question, which is currently escaping me. The STEMI. STEMI. Ah, um, so Minoka is about four to five percent of STEMI patients. And I agree with you, we probably missed some ST elevation. Plus, I find that sometimes we discount minor ST elevation in some patients, and I'm not always sure why that is if I look back. Um, but yeah, I think there is some ST elevation that's transient, and there is a fair amount of ST elevation in Minoka. We just don't have the kind of mechanistic information on that with the intracoronary imaging because our practice has been to get consent before cath. And you can't do that in a STEMI. Um, so I would argue that in STEMI cases moving forward with this information in mind, it's probably clinically appropriate to get intracoronary imaging to see what the pathogenesis of that event was because you have a unique window and unlike non-STEMI, you can see what the culprit is. Um, can you comment on, um, you know, the classic teaching is that if we see ST elevations, that's spasm. And so if we don't see ST elevations, then it probably isn't. We talked a little bit about that last yeah. night. Can you tell us your insights on that? I always thought that was the case. That's what I was taught in medical school, right? The only way you're going to diagnose spasm unless you see it in front of you is ST elevation on an ambulatory ECG. But now that I've had a number of patients undergo spasm testing in our laboratory by my colleague, Nat Smilowitz, I find that even with chest pain, some patients don't elevate their STs and yet they have easily provoked spasm that recapitulates their symptoms. And I guess it's like a lot of things in medicine, right? We used to think that dissection only happened to women who were pregnant or postpartum. And now that we know what we're looking for, we understand that it's more common than we think. We were just thinking of a very specific clinical scenario. Spasm can cause transient ST elevation, but it doesn't have to. When we used to uh, test for spasm all the time, just for no good reason, we didn't see a lot of it. Um, uh, but but yes, if you had if you had a French metal angina or something, you, you definitely did see it. See it pretty badly. But uh, you, you were talking about the incidence of spasm. So if you select Minoka patients mm -hmm. and then you test them for spasm, you get a lot of spasm. Yes. If you do, if you do. Spasm testing, a lot of people with stable ischemic heart disease, you don't find much. And exactly what you're saying, right? That tells me that spasm is much more likely to be part of Minoka pathogenesis. So in your practice right now, if you have a patient who is in the hospital, they already had a cath, troponin positive, you think it's an MI, mm -hmm. but you refer them to get a cardiac MRI. And let's say the MRI is negative for myocarditis. Are you sending them back to, I'm, I, I think I know the answer to that, but at what point are you going to say, okay, well, let's go back and do OCT or IVIS? I really am sending patients back to the cath lab only if they have persistent chest pain in that circumstance. And my practice is not everybody's practice. We have colleagues in Canada who are part of this study and they are, they see an infarct, they bring the patient back for OCT if it wasn't done first time around. In France, they're doing it that way. Um, but for me, I don't know that it makes sense to do another invasive test unless it's gonna change something in my management. And you know, you could argue OCT does, but I just give antiplatelet and statin. Um, so I will instead 
send that patient back to the lab if they're having persistent chest pain and I'm looking for spasm. And when they get provocative testing, we'll usually do intracoronary imaging at that point if we haven't done CT just to help with the statin decision. Right. Any other questions or comments? No? And, oh, um, just a quick question here, uh, Stéphane Effray. A beautiful uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Just can you remind us uh, just practically how can we select those patients for ARP2? Um, who who should we? So exclusively, we are, again, the entry point is MI and the normal angiogram. Thank you so much for asking that question because we'd love to get more patients into HARP. Um, the entry point is right now you're getting pre-cath consent. So this is somebody with MI who's stable enough for you to get a consent. And then as long as they their GFR is not too low for contrast, and you don't know that they have had already had a stent or surgery, you would enroll them, you would refer them to Pooja and to her uh, coordinator, Fauzia, for enrollment. And then if they have Minoka, meaning anything up to 45% stenosis on that angiogram, they would get three vessel OCT. And if they prove to have obstructive disease, then they just screen fail. So that's how we're selecting MI case and not known to have obstructive disease, GFR not too low for contrast. I would say if you have a STEMI case, if those of you in interventional cardiology and you image the culprit with OCT because you want to know if there's something going on there, we would enroll that patient afterward. But mostly these are going to be non-STEMIs that you consent beforehand. Does that answer your question? Yes. So in practice, you need to consent uh, basically uh, all your non-STEMI prior for the study prior to CATH. However, let's say if it's not if it's not been done for any mm -hmm. reason, if it's during the night and then um, it's non-obstructive, can we still consent if the patient is willing to go back to the cath lab? Uh, we don't do it that way, no. We do OCT at the same sitting as the angiogram. If your team clinically feels that they want OCT, then absolutely put them in the study and bring them back to the cath lab, as you were saying, Dr. Mehta. But if that's not the clinical decision, we wouldn't cath them just for the study. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds, Thanks for that for wonderful me. presentation. Thanks Thank you, everyone. Time. And I will see everyone next week. Um, don't forget to get your CME credit. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.